everybody, welcome back to another installment of the Foundations of Neural Science lecture series. Um, once again, I would like to thank Casey Henley for the amazing illustrations and animations, and of course, the Michigan State University for this book. Now, today we're going to be talking about the membrane at rest. Now, this might not seem like a very important thing uh, for many people, but uh, this is a very nice addition to the previous videos that I had about the membrane potential, etc., etc. So if you haven't watched those, go ahead and uh, give them a look. Now, at rest, if you guys remember, a neuron's membrane potential is negative relative to the outside environment typically around minus 65 to minus 70 millivolts. This negativity stems from, of course, the uneven distribution of ions across the cell membrane and the selective permeability of the membrane to those ions. Now, if you guys don't remember, selective permeability refers to the property of a neuron's membrane that allows certain ions like potassium or sodium to pass through more easily than others based on specific ion channels. Now on the image you can see above, there's a high concentration of sodium chloride and calcium outside the cell and a high concentration of potassium and negatively charged anions inside. And this distribution sets up the electrochemical gradients. If you guys remember, the chemical gradients drive the ions from areas of high to low concentration, and the electrical gradients attract or repel ions based on the charge. Now for potassium, or K+, as you can see, its chemical gradient pushes it outward, um, meaning a high concentration is inside compared to the outside, while the negative interior, or the electrical gradient, can pull the potassium back in. And this interplay is really important in determining, of course, the resting membrane potential. Now, even though the neuron is at rest, there is a constant, subtle flux of ions across the membrane. Now, on the image, you can see different non-gated, or leak, channels that remain open in a resting neuron. The potassium leak channels, which are the circled ones with the green stripes, they are far more in uh, amount than the other leak channels at rest. And what they do is they facilitate the very, very strong outward movement of the K plus or potassium ions, which strongly influence the membrane potential. Now, the sodium leak channels, which are in blue dots, they are in much smaller numbers, and they allow the sodium ions, or the Na+, to trickle into the cell, which offsets some of the K+, or potassium, influence toward minus 80 millivolts. Now, the chloride leak channels, which are yellow, are intermediately permeable compared to potassium, meaning they don't pass through as often. And they allow the chlorium, or the Cl-, the yellow ions, to move inward or outward depending on the momentary membrane potential versus chloride's equilibrium potential. Now, because potassium channels vastly outnumber the others, the resting membrane is considered most permeable to potassium, or K+, with lesser but uh, non-trivial contributions from sodium and chlorium. Now, if some of you have forgotten, the equilibrium potential is the electrical potential at which there is no net movement of a specific ion, like chlorium, across the membrane because the electrical and the chemical uh, concentration forces are balanced out. Now on the animation, you can see how potassium moves across to its electrochemical gradient. Um, due to the chemical gradient, the potassium ions move out of the cell from high to low concentration, and because of the electrical gradient, uh, the negative interior tries to draw the positive potassium ions back in. 
And both of these forces aim for a balance at about minus 80 millivolts, which is the equilibrium potential for potassium. And if potassium were the only ion crossing, uh, the cell's resting potential would stabilize there. Uh, but the presence of sodium and chloride channels keeps the membrane potential from reaching quite that negative. Now on this next animation, you can see that the other ions, particularly sodium, Na+, and chlorium, Cl-, also leak through the membrane at rest. Now the sodium has a strong drive inward, both electrically and chemically, but fewer channels. So its effect is basically muted, but still enough to bring the cell's potential above minus 80 millivolts. And chloride usually moves inward if the interior becomes too positive relative to chloride's own equilibrium potential. Its permeability is rather moderate, about half that of potassium. So overall, basically, the potassium outflow is balanced by the additional sodium and chlorium movements, which results in a resting potential typically around minus 65 to minus 70 millivolts. Now, leak channels, by nature, allow ions to continually drift towards their equilibrium. And over time, you might expect the gradients to dissipate now, what helps to prevent this? Well, the sodium-potassium pump does. Now, this pump uses energy in the form of ATP uh, to move three sodium ions out of the cell and two potassium ions in. And this moves the ions, of course, against their electrochemical gradients. And this is exactly why it requires energy in the form of ATP. Um, the pump basically helps keep the ionic concentrations at proper levels, both inside and outside the cell, um, at all times. Now let's talk a little bit about the Goldman equation. Now while the Nernst equation calculates the equilibrium potential for one ion, the Goldman equation factors in multiple ions and their relative permeabilities. So uh, the P ion is the membrane's permeability to that ion at rest. Um, the ion inside and outside is the ion concentration at each side of the membrane. And uh, 61 is the, um, it's a constant which uh, reflects the temperature and other physical uh, constraints in uh, mammalian systems, for example. Now, with K+, uh, typically, given the highest relative permeability, which is often set to 1, smaller values for uh, sodium, uh, in other words, 0 0.04, and intermediate values for chlorium, or 0 0.4, yields a calculation close to minus 65 millivolts. And changes in any ion's relative permeability or concentration can shift the resting membrane potential, um, which is, of course, really important for understanding how neurons respond to stimuli. So overall, a neuron's resting membrane potential hinges on potassium's dominant permeability, supplementary sodium and chloride flux, and the continuous action of the sodium-potassium pump. In this slightly negative resting state, um, the neuron stands ready to generate the rapid electrical signals whenever it reaches threshold, which we will of course talk about later.